Oh fuck. Reinvent myself constantly so you can buy more stuff from me. Reinvent myself constantly. Invent myself constantly. Hi, I did not expect that video to get that many views. I am a small bean on this platform. I make my stuff in my little corner. Um, this has been an extremely intense week. I wasn't really planning on making this second video, but because so many people saw that other one, I think it is responsible of me to do this small follow-up to clarify some of my opinions. I'm just some random person on the internet that's putting two and two together and sharing my answer with people and being like, is this, is this, does this make sense? I have linked resources below the first article that was written about parasocial relationships by the people who coined the term and uh, video essays, so just go and check them out. And I'm really, really thankful for every single person who took time to type out their own experiences in the comments. If you're still unsure if what Shane Dawson has done is really that bad, I recommend going to read the comments section under my previous video. Just please go and check them out. It's interesting to note that in 2019, I would have never made that video about Shane Dawson. And that is partially because of parasocial relationships and fan bases. This is one of the reasons why so many people are coming out and talking about this now and not before. It is pretty scary to criticise someone with a fan base like Shane Dawson's. It's understandable that so many people are talking about this now. Before, a lot of people were just too afraid to. And this is another side of parasocial relationships that we do need to think about, I think, is how they express themselves and become even stronger when there is this group connection in a fan base. The love and the idealization of this person, like Shane, for example, is shared by so many people at once that it can become extremely intense. A whole mob of audience members that absolutely idealizes you and will attack um, any critic. It's, it's pretty scary, that's a lot of power. If the influencer doesn't do anything to rein them in, fan bases can cause serious damage. I'd be interested in hearing other people's opinions on this, but I also do think it's up to the creator to communicate with their fan base about what behaviour is appropriate or not. If you've targeted someone personally and your fans go after them, and you don't say anything, then that silence is basically you just endorsing the harassment. Because in that situation, fans will automatically attack someone if you are publicly attacking them yourself. How much responsibility does the creator have in this kind of situation? Shane's fan base has viciously attacked people who have criticised Shane. I see quite a lot of content creators trying to avoid accountability for the actions that their fan bases can have. Back to the meta commentary on my own video from a week ago. That was not my most planned work. I didn't really think it through as much as some of the other videos that were on my channel. I had something to say and I said it, and I was pretty angry and emotional while filming that video. I think that was pretty clear, <laughs> very intense. There are absolutely things that I would have said differently or I would have explained better if I had known so many people were going to watch that video. And that's on me, right? That's something that I need to think about for my future videos. It's something that I need to be careful about in the sense that I cannot underestimate the reach that a video like that could potentially have, because if I do underestimate it and I don't take it seriously, then I could use a hazy, foggy term like rating underage fans when maybe saying, commenting on and sexualizing the bodies of underage fans in your videos would be a better way to describe what was happening. But when so many people watch your content, there is a lot more responsibility on you, on your actions, and on your words. And that's something that Shane Dawson has never really had. This this concept of responsibility or using your platform responsibly is just not something that it's just not something that he does. The minute that you upload a video, you lose control of that video and then you have to sit back and think about how that content that you have created and made is affecting the world. The fact that my last video did get so many views, more than I'm used to, has really made me think hard about this concept of responsibility. I'm not even a big creator, but even with one video getting over 450,000 views, I guess that's why I've just become completely obsessed with this idea of responsibility for the past uh, two weeks now. So, uh, that's this video. Think about this for a second. Making videos is an extremely long process, and I think some people do underestimate the process. There is a lot to do, from the idea stage, to the writing, to the filming, to the lighting, to the audio, to the editing, and then to the re-editing because you forgot stuff, and then you export it, and then there's a bug, and then you have to re-export it. It can be quite a time-consuming task. 
And the fact that it's so time consuming means that there is quite a lot of time to step back from what you're making during the process and to ask yourself, what am I doing? Is this good? Have I thought about my responsibility as someone with a platform? Who is my target audience? The reason I want to expand on this concept of responsibility is that I've seen quite a few people trying to find something or someone to blame for the Shane Dawson situation. Oh, times were different back then, that's why. Oh, but the parents should have been there, right, to um, prevent their kids from watching him. I think the issue here is that we are so used to absolutely no accountability being taken by large YouTube creators that we've almost lost hope in even ever seeing any accountability from them. And so we're now trying to desperately find some other way that we can control what kids are seeing on YouTube and how we can protect vulnerable people. We just can't even imagine what accountability would look like for Shane Dawson. YouTubers have basically been able to avoid taking responsibility for their own content for years, just floating around in this space that's not real life but it is still kind of real life. What is happening? We are not responsible for the content that you are watching. Give us money. I would like to underline YouTube's complete lack of moderation on its website. It is pretty incredible and, and honestly quite shocking. I've been thinking about this lack of moderation in hindsight. It's not really that shocking. Shane Dawson has made a lot of money for YouTube because he built his platform making content for kids. Advertisers really wanted the advertising spots on channels that were making content for kids. They are at an age where brand recognition and stuff is really starting to form in their minds and it's the best way to make them lifelong consumers of a brand. And this was before there was any kind of regulation concerning kids and advertising on YouTube. Shane Dawson was making a lot of money for this platform and for him. I also think this lack of accountability that we have seen on YouTube is what has pushed commentary videos into the limelight. I mean, so many people are watching commentary videos because there is absolutely no accountability and people are just so thirsty for some semblance of justice that commentary videos have exploded. There is no moderation by YouTube and so People who make commentary videos have become these vigilante moderators by simply calling out the people who are doing awful, awful stuff and attempting to affect their platform, which is what I'm doing now. <laughs> Some people commented on my video about Shane Dawson and parasocial grooming that parents should be the ones to step in and prevent their kids from using YouTube while they are children. And I'm... I'm I... I'm, I'm a bit biased, but let me explain why I don't agree with this. In my opinion, the biggest, biggest, biggest responsibility, the person who made the content, who wrote it, scripted, recorded, the audio, the lighting, the editing, the exporting, the uploading, that is the person who is responsible for the effects of that content on the world. If that person isn't using their platform responsibly, and when I say isn't using their platform responsibly, I mean, you know, grooming kids, then I think it is up to YouTube to step in and do something. I think it's such a shame. I learned how to do so much stuff on the internet and on YouTube when I was younger, and I don't think that I'd make videos or make music if I didn't have access to the internet when I was younger. And I think that preventing your children from going on YouTube is just going to make YouTube into this very, you know, ooh, what's on YouTube? And they'll probably end up going on YouTube anyway, but they just won't talk to you about it. And I think the most important thing is to communicate with your kids about what they are watching. If you are interested in what creators your kids are fans of, then it will be way easier to see the red flags. The internet is a valuable source of knowledge, and in my opinion, we can't just exclude kids from it because there are some awful adults doing awful things. I'm much more interested in deplatforming the awful adults doing the awful things, because I don't think kids should be punished for the actions of these fucking adult men. Why? That doesn't make sense to me. I know that from about nine years old and onwards, I was learning so much stuff online. I would have been so pissed off if someone stopped me from accessing all of that knowledge. And thinking back to me back then, if someone had banned me from going on YouTube, I probably would have found a way to get on YouTube. I was a lot more social media savvy than my parents back then. And I think kids nowadays are probably way more tech savvy than you are or than I am. What I'm saying is that it feels more like a plaster or a, a band-aid 
on the issue instead of actually looking at the systemic problem. Let's think about this idea for a second and expand on it. If it is the parents' responsibility to prevent children from being groomed by creators on YouTube, then what about kids that don't really have much guidance at home and whose parents are just too busy? What about if a parent leaves their child with a laptop alone for 10 minutes while they cook dinner and the child watches a video of Shane Dawson, like a highly sexualized, inappropriate video of Shane Dawson that is specifically catering to kids? Is that the parent's fault? Who is to blame? The parent who didn't know about their child's whereabouts online for 10 minutes, or the adult man who recorded, scripted, uploaded, edited the video? Obviously, I'm not saying that Shane's process looks exactly like mine. All I'm trying to say here is that he has spent a lot of time in his life putting together these videos and uploading them and building his career on this content. It makes it even more shocking when you think about how much time has gone into this. I completely understand why parents are horrified about all of this and want to take this into their own hands. My view of this whole thing is looking at the bigger picture. I personally think that we should probably be setting an example with this kind of situation so that we can signal that this platform is not okay with grooming. This platform is not okay with hurting kids. It just seems to me like the simplest option in this kind of situation is to put the responsibility on the shoulders of the person who actually made the content, because then we can work towards a goal of saying maybe this guy shouldn't be able to make videos. The adult man who spent dozens of hours making sexualized content that was specifically targeting kids. I know who I'm putting the blame on in that situation. Children will always have times when they are alone on the internet, and I think that's something that we need to accept now that our society is becoming more and more online. If we tolerate the presence of content like Shane's on YouTube, or if we tolerate his presence even though he put it all online, and there are just no consequences for his actions whatsoever, we have to accept this is going to happen again and again and again. Because if we don't deplatform people who do this, people are just going to do it and then say, oh, I didn't know it was that bad. And then everyone will be like, oh, okay, I guess uh, um, that just doesn't seem right to me. It just seems so... Ugh, it feels wrong. So I'm not really into punishment, right? I don't think in this case, deplatforming is necessarily punishment. I think deplatforming is what taking accountability would look like. I mean, taking accountability definitely does not look like just making some shitty apology videos and going back to making a fortune. Obviously, there is a huge difference here between what I think will happen and what I think should happen. I don't think that Shane is going to do the right thing and leave. He hasn't removed any merch links from his social media profiles, and he's still releasing merchandise. What I'm doing here in this video is trying to imagine what accountability would look like in this kind of situation. What would be the most impressive thing to do that would also have an impact on the platform where this actually happened? Obviously, do let me know what you think in the comments. Although, I've got to admit, I don't think anything that could happen in the future will change my opinion that this guy should retire. It's not even that big of a deal, like what, you spent more than 10 years being like the king of YouTube and now you can't be anymore? Oh, poor you, I guess? Oh no, you'll have to move to a smaller place and then survive off of your millions for years comfortably? That sounds awful. Oh no, you're going to lose your status as an influencer. I think that's a pretty fair price to pay when you've been making sexualized content targeting kids for years. That, that seems like a pretty good deal. I think that that would be taking accountability like we've never really seen on YouTube. If this guy completely removes himself from the platform, then I'm still not gonna like him or anything, but it, it would... It would be cool, I guess, if, if, if that happened. The responsibility lies with the person making the videos. These people are paid to entertain you. If we can demonstrate that their content has harmed potentially thousands of kids, then I think it's pretty fair to argue that they should lose their job. I'm responsible for what's on my channel, and I'm constantly thinking about my previous uploads and is this a good upload? Should I keep it? You know, it's just something that you do when you have a platform, even when it's small. 
That's why I'm posting this video now, because I'm responsible for my video about Shane, and I wanted to clear up some things because of the impact that that video had. Asking myself if I phrased everything correctly, because I probably didn't. Asking myself what I could do better next time, because you always can. And that is what responsibility is, right? That's, that's what it is. It's part of it, is questioning yourself. And that is something that Shane Dawson did not do. Throughout the entire process of making all of these fucking disgusting videos, he only deleted them about a month ago. These are not the actions of someone acting responsibly. These are the actions of someone who is terrified of losing their platform and their wealth. It's all about the money. It is just incredible to me that people are making excuses for a man who made The Millie Show. He didn't step back and think, hmm, what effect could this have on my target audience, who are children? If someone isn't capable of doing this, especially if they are making content for children, then they should not have a platform the size of Shane Dawson's. Do I think that he did all of this on purpose? I don't know, I'm not in his head, and I don't think it matters what his intentions were, because it's not about the intentions, it's about the impact. Does intention matter when the effect that you're having on your child audience is extremely similar to the effects of child grooming? Does it matter if someone is a paedophile or not when their words are virtually indistinguishable from what a paedophile would say? It absolutely does not matter. I don't really care if he thought that what he was doing was normal, or if he was depressed, whatever other excuse that people are, are, are making. Even with that charitable interpretation that we can't even confirm is true or not, the responsibility lies with the creator, especially when they are an adult who is making content that is specifically designed to appeal to children. I'm not interested in knowing why Shane did what he did. I'm interested in the fact that he did it. I also do believe in apologies, although I did make fun of Shane's, and I'm, I'm not sorry. I don't think that apologies are a sign of weakness. I think apologies can be really cool, and the faster you get it over with, the better. But it really does depend on the weight of the issue, doesn't it? I mean, Shane Dawson is trying to use this taking accountability video like a swipe card to get out of the cancel zone. That is absolutely absurd. It is surreal. It is almost funny. Even if this apology video was the most honest and sincere piece of media that I had ever seen in my entire life, I would still be like, you should retire though. I got one more question quite a lot underneath that video. A lot of people were really, really, really interested in knowing. Are you a girl or a boy? Just a question. The curiosity and uncertainty make me unease. Just a bit. Is your curiosity stinging now? I don't owe you anything. Are you aching for answers now? I
Thank you to Mountain Snow, Reasonably Agitated Honeybee, Ezekiel Panapucci, Cynical Boomer, Leon Sinclair, Jason Miller, Lunos Nocturne, Moira, Alex Maskell, Hazel, Nellis, Potato Royd, and LPQ Silver. <laughs> 